Hello. I was sick, but I am better now, hence the gap in uploads. Welcome back to the fourth episode of Hyrule Science, a series where I'm going to explore every feasible item in Tears of the Kingdom and see if I can find out anything interesting about them, starting with the compendium. But first, let's read some comments. Quick disclaimer, there are a lot of comments here, so I might not be able to read all of the comments from the last video. Thank you for commenting and sharing facts about the game with me and other people nonetheless. Sharing helpful information is what I strive to do in this series, and it's always heartwarming to see others do the same in the comments. The Blocked Crafter and Jason Rocks pointed out how Silent Princess is stronger than Blue Nightshade when cooked, which I missed because I usually only cook one item at a time for testing. It is indeed more powerful than Nightshade. Lixie Joy pointed out how you can use bomb arrows for most of the shrine puzzles with larger buttons. I'm not sure how I overlooked this in the last video, because I did it in my first playthrough, but it's a pretty easy way to bypass a lot of intended shrine solutions. Birdlegs Cast, Dark Matter, and Gale Lulu pointed out how I never mentioned multi-shot bows, which I never tested for beehives. They do in fact shoot multiple bees. I'm not sure what the limit on bees is, but they do start despawning after a few seconds. Cervical Vertebrae and Snacker6 let me know that fusing beehives to magic rods make them attack differently. Unfortunately, this does not seem to be the case, and both different weapon types do the same thing, simply spawning a bee when attacking. Feel free to let me know if I missed something, though. Mr. Rupier and Dark Metal commented how attacking, then swapping to and from your beehive weapon will let you spawn another swarm of bees, which seems to check out. It's the same as multi-shot bows though, where there doesn't appear to be a limit, but there is a time limit before they start to disappear. Weird One stated that strong fire will dynamically change if Link is set on fire by it. Unfortunately, there is no visual change as opposed to normal fire, but Link does take more damage in the stronger fire, one entire heart rather than a half heart. Dino Charlie and Ethan pointed out how you can reignite an elemental stone talus with the corresponding element. And, hey, it works. Not sure why you'd want to do this, but it's a cool feature nonetheless. Togi Namaki asked if Forest Dweller weapons worked with pine cones and bright blooms. Unfortunately, the pine cones don't work and just burn away. But it does indeed work for bright blooms. Large bright blooms will go on a 15 second timer before they can be used again, and the regular ones go on a 10 second timer. In case you're wondering, the weapon swap exploit does not work on Forest Dweller weapons. By the way, thanks to Toganamaki for testing out if it works or not beforehand. Huglike asked if stronger fires from pine cones make your weapon burn away faster. In my testing, I used a pine cone branch which lasted 50 seconds before burning. Using a normal tree branch, it burned away in 60 seconds. The stronger fire turns into normal fire after 10 seconds, even on your weapon. So my guess is that the strong fire deals twice the amount of burning damage, which is shortening the timer by 10 seconds. The more you know. Dom Forwards asked if the stamina bonus from Endura Carrots for horses is stacked. Nope. Even draining a single Endura Carrot Spur, then giving the horse another simply maxes it out at 3 extra spurs. Galilululu, <laughs> that's hard to say. Galilululu and Chris let me know how attaching any mushroom to your shield guarantees a disarm for basic enemies. Which it does! It even works for mushrooms like truffles. Not sure how I missed this earlier, but it's good that I got it now. Kino stated that you can use Dazzle Fruit and a multi-shot bow and light puzzles to bypass them. No. And for our last comment, XYZ Keyblader asked what happens if you try to cook bomb flowers. Thank you guys again for commenting. It helps me, the algorithm, and other people online. But for now, let's do some science. All of the Choo Choo Jelly types are basically more powerful versions of their fruit counter types, having a larger blast radius and working almost identically to the elemental fruits. One property that these do not have in common with fruit is that you can change their element by throwing another element at them, no matter what type they are. They actually do work on forest dweller weapons, surprisingly enough, but with the larger blast radius, I highly recommend using a longer weapon like a forest dweller spear. Kisai balls are a really cool addition to this game. Instead of simply being another elixir ingredient, it's also used to home in on the weak points of enemies when shot with an arrow. Each of the different elemental types of Kisai balls will also emit a large explosion with their type, which really helps you with annihilating Gleox.
I'd also like to note its usefulness for Froxes, which can be especially hard to hit with their tiny eye. So far I cannot find a difference between the Keys Eyeballs, Octorok Eyeballs, and Aracuda Eyeballs, apart from the latter ones doing more damage. Unfortunately, attaching one to a weapon does not let the weapon home in on enemies when thrown. One final thing I'd like to note about Eyeballs is that when shot from a bow, the arrows go a lot further, so if you're out of wings, try these. Speaking of wings, Keys Wings are also really cool, letting you shoot arrows a lot further, which make them great for sniping things far away. Like the eyeballs, they also emit a large explosion when using elemental variants, letting you shock or freeze enemies from far away. Similarly to the eyeballs, I have yet to find any differences in each of the wing types aside from doing more damage. Also, I'm not sure why, but Mulduga fins look very goofy on arrows. Might want to patch that Nintendo. I forgot this in Tome editing just now, you can attach a key swing to a weapon to make it fly further when thrown as well. Most basic enemy horns do mostly the same things, increase the damage of your weapons. All sharp weapons can do sharp things like cut down trees and grass, and blunt weapons do blunt things like mine ores. But Coblin horns are sharp, Moblin horns are blunt, Lizalfa horns are sharp, look cool, and have elemental variants. Horriblin horns are blunt, Lionel horns are blunt and sharp, Construct horns are sharp, and Hinox horns are blunt. With Gleok horns, they're pretty unique. It might throw you off at first considering that fusing one to a weapon will remove the weapon's blade, but I think the developers were trying to go for a more lightsaber feel, where there's an elemental blade that stretches out when you attack. These also have infinite charge, so you never need to worry about not being able to freeze or shock something when you're attacking a bunch of times. One thing I should note is that fusing a horn to a shield allows you to do a shield bash attack to attack the enemy with the horn, which also includes Gleok horns. Sharp horns even get a slightly different bash animation doing this. Like like stones are blunt and the elemental variants give off small elemental attacks, and frox fangs are just blunt. Gibda bones are a one-time use material and do 40 damage, making them fantastic for bows. Go check out this video if you'd like to see them in their full prowess. Stalnox Horns and Mulduga Jaws both benefit from Bone Weapon Proficiency, which makes them do 80% more damage and stacks with Attack Up 3. If there are, let me know of any other materials that stack with Bone Proficiency. Finishing off the compendium, let's talk about Dragon Parts. Their best use is for armor upgrades, and most if not all of them have the same effect when shot from a bow and attached to a weapon. That being a huge AoE of elemental damage with bows, and a simple elemental effect for weapons. Except for Light Dragon Parts. When you fuse a Light Dragon Part to a weapon, you restore a quarter of a heart every time you hit something. Notice how I say something, because this applies to non-enemy things like crates and even ores. Also, this is a funny little glitch I discovered while testing, for some reason, that Light Dragon Shard, when drawn from a bow, makes an electric arrow sound even though it's not electric. It's not meaningful, I just thought it was neat. And that's all for me for today. Looks like we finished the entire compendium. Hell yeah. Which means I get to start working on non-compendium items. I thank you for getting this far into the video, I hope you learned something new. Please be sure to subscribe to get the funny YouTube bars get big. If you have any tips you'd like to share, just hit up the comments. Thanks again for watching, and have a good time zone.